unfortunately we had to cancel the kids because there were so many kids coming. I'll just start recording, Chair, bear with me. Yeah, no worries. <clears throat> okay, welcome to Homes and Safe Communities on the 16th of December 2021. May I remind everybody present that the meeting is being live streamed as well as recorded via the internet and the recording archive for future viewing. Could all participants please mute themselves when not speaking in order to avoid any background noise or feedback when other participants are speaking? If a participant wishes to speak, can they please put their hand up if they can be seen on screen or use the raise hand function? Please ensure that all debate is raised verbally and not via the chat function for the sake of the recording. The chat function may be used to highlight any technical issues to the chairman or democratic services officer. If any participant has difficulty hearing or being heard when they are addressing the committee, then they should let the chairman or democratic officer know. If they have a webcam, then they should try turning this off as this will help with the broadband or Wi-Fi bandwidth so they can at least hear and be heard. OK. Item number one is apologies for absence. Have we received any? Uh, <clears throat> no, Chair, I've not had anything formally, but I think Councillor Perks wants to raise something now. Bear with me. OK, go ahead, Councillor Perks. Oh, hi, Chair. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, it's just to say, unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave the meeting between half six and 20 to seven this evening. OK, thank you. Yeah, Chair, I'm, I may have to slip off early as well as Jonathan, Jonathan Bird, but um, I'm hoping to last the full course, but I, I just don't know. Yeah, okay. and, and, and Andrew Parker, uh, I'm, I'm the same as well, so uh, I'll see how long before I have to go. OK, thank you. Agenda item number two is the minutes of the meeting held on the 10th of November 2021. Are we happy with these? Yes, Chair, happy to move the minutes. Any Ooh, we know. Yeah. yeah. That was second. OK, thank you. Item number three, to receive declarations of interest. Have we got any? I'm taking that silence as a great big no. OK, thank you. Um, due to the officer's time constraints this evening, we have moved agenda items numbers 9 to 12 up to the next item. So, Carolyn, if you'd like to go ahead. Yes, thank you, Jack. Can I just thank you for um, allowing the agenda to be changed around today at last no, minute? No, thank no. you very much. Um, the report is on the revenue monitoring for the position as at the end of September. So the report uh, starts off by advising that this time of year, we revise the budget for any technical adjustments and any environments. Um, these don't alter the bottom line position of the committee uh, outturn, uh, and they are minor. But as I say, just to confirm, they don't alter the bottom line position. They are for our, our internal needs. Um, the report goes on to advise that the current projected outturn for this year um, is an outturn within budget, which is as reported in previous months. Um, but there is a caveat in there, which is regarding um, the CCTV, that there may be a shortfall. And if at year end we can't cover that from other areas of the, um, the, the sort of committee, uh, we will have to draw down from reserves. So to say of that one, we're sort of keeping a, a sort of a watching brief on that to see how things go during the rest of the year. Um, we have been, uh, for members' information, been drawing down um, loss of income funding from Welsh Government. So um, we have, for instance, on the DFGs, um, we have we do we do charge us for that, and we are able to claim that it is eligible to claim from Welsh Government. So we have been doing that where appropriate. Um, the report then goes on to look at the capital programme. 
Um, there is only one change that uh, relates to this committee since the last time we reported, and that's the inclusion of the uh, Panath food pod. Um, so that's a sort of a rundown of where we are on this committee, and I'm happy to take any questions. OK, thank you. If there are any questions, may I ask that we keep them short and to the point, as we do have a lot to go through on this agenda tonight. Do we have any questions? I'm, I'm seeing that as a, I'm not seeing any hands up and uh, nobody's asking to speak. So if you'd like to go on to the next item, then please, Carolyn. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I think the next item is the um, revenue uh, position for uh, 22 23. So um, the provisional settlement will not be received until the 21st of December. It's it's, it's late again this year, uh, but in, all, in order to enable consultation, um, this report is therefore has to be based on several variant scenarios. So uh, for next year, we've we've modelled on the settlement from Welsh Government being a potential 1% reduction, uh, a potential 1% increase, a cash neutral position and the same increase as the council received this year, which was a 4.42% increase. Um, in order to build a picture uh, for what next year's budget requirements are, services were asked to submit cost pressures and cost pressures across the council totaled 22 and a half million. And then there was also pay and national insurance um, pressures on top of that. Um, the pressures that relate to this particular uh, committee are detailed in Appendix 1 and total 2.2 million. Um, but just to provide an update, um, one of those pressures is uh, bed and breakfast pressure. Um, and Welsh Government have potentially agreed, and I might ask if Mike's on the meeting to see if there's anything further you'd like to add, but um, Welsh Government has agreed uh, to potentially fund some of the block booking um, rooms from next year, um, which will obviously um, reduce that cost pressure. So as I say, I think this is sort of um, still being discussed, but it's it's potential there. So the £2.2 .2 million pound that's currently shown for this committee could actually reduce. Um, there's currently no savings identified. Oh, Mike, do you want to do you want to say something straight away, Mike? Chair, sure, can can I yeah. just clarify? Yeah, sure. clarify. Sure. Um, we we've actually met Welsh government officials actually this afternoon, and they have clarified that funding is available to fund the hotel provision next year. Um, we've been requested to um, block book provision from. Uh, a Welsh Government allocation for this year to cover for next year. We're currently considering um, the demand and the need for that hotel accommodation into next year, given that we're aware that there are a, a number of uh, housing developments which will come on stream next year, which will obviously be able to be uh, utilised for residents who are currently in um, uh, temporary accommodation, whether that be hotels, bed and breakfast, councils, hostel, shared accommodation. So um, we are still in discussion with Welsh Government just to clarify and confirm how that mechanism may work. I think the last thing we'd want to do is to block book more rooms in, in, in accommodation for the whole year and find that those rooms were left empty. Um, so uh, as I say, we've still got some uh, negotiation and discussions with Welsh Government, but there is an assurance that funding is available for next year uh, for whatever we need. Thank you, Mike. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, we then uh, carried on modelling. We've looking, looked at various levels of council tax uh, that could potentially be um, raised next year. Again, as I say, this is only um, some examples modelling is not, not the final um, position. So we looked at 3.2%, which was the then uh, CPI back in August. We appreciate this has now changed. 3.9%, um, which was the uh, increase for last year. And if we would try to take the uh, council tax to the Welsh average, that'd be increase of 705 um, so paragraph uh, 2.8 of the report therefore shows a table which shows the variant shortfalls with these different combination of scenarios with the lowest being 13.6 million and the highest being 20, 26 million. So at the moment, you know, that, that they are into sort of addictive figures. 
Um, as I say, we don't know what the settlement is from Welsh Government and obviously the cost pressure position is changing um, as we speak. Um, so members are asked for their recommendations or any comments they have, which would be forwarded to Corporate Performance and Resources uh, Scrutiny Committee, who will in turn pass recommendations on to Cabinet uh, so that the um, budget can be um, established for next year. Uh, if this will go to Cabinet in February and the final proposals will go to Council in March to enable the Council tax to be set by the 11th of March. Um, and um, also, at Appendix 3 of the report are the levels of reserves for this committee uh, for information. So, um, as if members would like to make any, any comments, recommendations, or I'm happy to take any um, questions. OK, thank you. I can see two hands up. Councillor Brooks, if you'd like to go first, your hand was first. Lovely, thank you, Chair. Um, and thanks for that, Carolyn. And that's really good news, Mike, um, around the temporary accommodation. Obviously, that helps with the cost pressures quite substantially there. Um, can I just ask around, um, we've got Caddickston House there, uh, up for a review of that. Have you got any more information around that and what you're actually going to be looking at? Because I think it is important that we do need to look at all pressures that there are and alternative ways of delivering our programme. So do you want to if just any thoughts around that? Uh, thank, thank you, Councillor Brooks. Um, the cost pressure for Caddickson House is a direct result of changes in terms of occupancy and the way that some of our third sector partners and some council services have reconfigured during the pandemic. Uh, they're delivering services in different ways and from different locations. Um, the one of the social services teams at Caddickson House will be relocating in the new financial year to the hub, um, uh, to a new hub, um, which is going to be located adjacent to Homeview, um, and, and will link in with the Flying Start service, which is already uh, opposite there in uh, um, uh, in in the old pump house. That leaves us with a, a bit of an issue in the income stream for the running costs for Caddickson House exceed income. I've written to Welsh Government because the original grant funding for the scheme uh, for the uh, renovation at Caddickson House was actually funded uh, through Welsh Government uh, funding. Uh, there is a clawback provision. So one of the options clearly that we, we've looked at is the potential to declare the site uh, or the accommodation surplus and and how does that impact and the cost pressure there indicates the potential clawback position for welsh government in terms of the grant there are other options clearly that we're considering um, the future alternative use of the building um, uh, other organizations potentially that may wish um, uh, uh, to consider use whether that be um, short term, medium term or long term. Um, and, and thirdly, our own uses. So could that building be used, for example, for housing purposes? Um, as I say, all of these are, are options at the moment, um, but I think the cost pressure is the worst case scenario in the event that the council was required to dispose of the building. Um, how would we uh, um, obviously fund um, that 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 clawback provision from Welsh government. So um, that that's sort of where we're at at the at the moment in terms of Caddickson House. Oh, that's great. Thanks for that. Um, I mean, I was there at the inception of, of when we actually refurbished Caddickson House, and I mean, it was a fantastic piece of work and the funding at the time from Welsh government. And I was there for the opening as well. So uh, so that's that's great. Just glad to see that you're actually looking at all the options there. You know, I, I think it's probably potential. I think it's just important probably just to stress that it's not a, a, a reduction in services in any yeah, way, shape or form, right. because as members will be aware from their own constitu constituency and, and ward discussions that there are considerable issues with uh, residents suffering at the moment with drug and alcohol addictions. And uh, it, it's effectively that those services are being coordinated and run now from, from alternative accommodation. Yeah, that's lovely. Thanks, Mike. Councillor Bird, you're next. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, Mike, just could you clarify for me the, the um, news from Welsh Government? Will that negate the full two million then? Um, it probably won't negate the full two million. Um, that that two million cost pressure was 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 full year cost, um, based on a hundred and nearly a hundred and twenty rooms that we're currently occupying in three hotels. Uh, clearly, if uh, we anticipate and, and and estimate numbers to be less than that then uh, it would be a proportion of that two million that would would um, uh, would remain. I don't think for one minute going into next year and given where we currently are in this wave of the pandemic, I can't see there being a significant reduction in cases coming in, new cases coming in through the front door. So I suppose it is that sort of supply and demand that we would consider, but I would anticipate that we wouldn't be necessarily using 120 rooms. Um, possibly, we've discussed possibly around 60, potentially 60 units into the first six months of the year. Okay, thanks, Mike. It, it's um, yeah, it, it eases my concern of knowing that a big chunk of it is likely to be negated. Thanks. Okay, Councillor Hanks. Thank you, Chair. Can I just ask about the um, CCTV within our community? This seems to be on the agenda for like years now, and we seem to be waiting for, for the police to join us. I think it's become knowledgeable now that CCTV in Lantwa is no more, as in maybe other areas. Um, and I think we need to move forward with this if we can, and just wondered um, where the way forward is, please, Mike. Um, just, just to to clarify, in terms of the the CCTV provision, provision, we 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 have seventy seven uh, CCTV CCTV cameras in in the Vale of Morgan. Um, the problem that we have, as as you'll be aware, Councillor Hanks, is that on occasion numbers or certain cameras um, fall fall out of use um, as a result of the age of the existing CCTV stock that. Um, we currently have, and, and you'll be aware that obviously council has committed uh, a capital allocation of, of £350,000 to renew the CCTV stock in the Vale. There are no current plans to reduce the number of CCTV um, um, uh, cameras. Um, the reason for the delay, uh, as you quite rightly say, um, clearly the council funds entirely at this time all of the revenue costs related to cctv and the number of partners and agencies who obviously take advantage of the council cctv system the council has been obviously exploring opportunities to increase revenue income from those partners um, what i can confirm as an update is that the police and crime commissioner um, and officials within the Police and Crime Commissioner's Office have indicated that they are prepared to revenue fund um, uh, the, the, the cost of CCTV monitoring in, in the Vale. Um, we're currently working with Cardiff Council uh, to develop uh, a regional approach to CCTV monitoring in, in connection with the BCU for, 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 for the Vale and, and Cardiff. Uh, rather than 22 authorities all maintaining operating systems, um, surely it's better that with the technology availability that we could streamline that. I'm advised by the PCC, PCC's office that a report is due to go before their executive board shortly um, uh, with a business case uh, which would support that revenue position. Uh, I have no date at the moment as to when um, that that may or may not be agreed. Um, and, and therefore, um, as I say, two things really. One is to confirm that the council isn't considering walking away from CCTV. It's purely and simply a case of 
um, a fair and proportionate contribution, I think, from partners in terms of future revenue. Um, and that's sort of where we are at, at, at the moment. In the interim and in the meantime, we continue to have our CCTV cameras uh, being monitored by Bridgend Council, and that continues uh, till the end of March uh, at the moment. Um, and we are continuing through our contractor, our CCTV contractor, to work to um, repair uh, cameras that, that, that are not working. Um, it is becoming increasingly difficult for the contractor because of the age of some of the camera stock that we have. But I would reassure the councillor Hanks that there is no intention to um, withdraw CCTV usage in Flanswick Major. OK, thank you. Councillor Perks. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, clarify with um, Mike. The um, We've previously had cost pressures around the service that supports people who are suffering domestic violence uh, and uh, abuse. And I just wondered whether I didn't see that in the cost pressures for this year. So is that sort of uh, safe for this year, if you like? Yeah, a a absolutely, Councillor Burks. The um, the the pressure position that we've had in earlier years was was resolved to a certain extent through the uh, pilot dark project now becoming mainstream and being um, revenue funded uh, out of base budget. Uh, we've also been successful in um, attracting further grant assistance from Welsh Government over the last uh, 12 to 18 months. Um, and that funding position has allowed us to uh, um, um, implement additional services. Um, we've also been able, uh, as, as you may be aware, or, or members may be aware, to uh, employ um, a, a CHIDVA, um, an advocate for, particularly for children who have been affected um, through um, witnessing um, uh, domestic violence within the home. We already had an IDVA. And we've also recently um, recommissioned our domestic abuse service uh, through at Oliver mm. and we've now entered into a long-term contract uh, in terms of future provision. And of course, what has helped us greatly in, in that regard is the additional funding that we've received through the housing support grant programme, uh, over a, a million uh, pounds extra um, uh, we've been able to draw down this year. Um, and hence the reason that there is no cost pressure in this in this year's uh, round. Oh, thank you very much, Mike. I, I'm sort of really pleased to hear that. I know that uh, everyone's been working hard to ensure that, you know, the cost pressure was alleviated, if you like, because this service, as we all know, is very uh, valuable and sort of, you know, something that the Vale Council um, sees as exemplary, really. So thank you very much for that. Councillor Nugent Finn. Thank you, Chair. Mike, I'm just asking a question going back a little bit. Um, do you know we have a relatively new drug and alcohol uh, outreach service in the Vale of Morgan. Do you know where they're currently based? I presume it's the um, the docks office. Um, off off the top of my head, I don't know. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, okay. I can I can. What I'll do is I'll, I'll speak to our lead and ask mm. uh, to provide you with a list of. Uh, uh, current outreach services and, and locations. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Given the nature, Mike, they may <laughs> just have a base and work uh, in outreach provision. I'm not sure, but um, I'm just wondering if you knew where they were. That'd be great. Thank you, Mike. That's it from me. Thank you, Chair. You'll be all happy to know. <laughs> OK, thank you, councillors. Um, if there are no more questions, I'd like to go on to item number 11, the initial capital programme proposals, 2022 oh, to 2023. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just... sorry, Councillor Brooks, I didn't see you pop your hand up. If you'd like to go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I seem to, can you hear me? I seem to... Yes, I can hear you. Oh, you're muted again now. You've got to mute you, uh, Councillor Brooks. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. 
Yeah, I took it. It's also just frozen on my screen for some reason. Um, it's just obviously these are cost pressures and it needs to go to corporate resources. Um, so do we need to take out the uh, B&B accommodation? Because obviously that's not a cost pressure now, is it? So does that need to be removed? Or if not, a note with it uh, explaining um, you know, wh where we are with the funding? Yes, I think if you'd like to comment, you know, if you want to make a comment and put any comment forward on, on the other cost pressures, and it might be, um, you know, we couldn't actually note that it was um, reported at committee that that cost pressure um, will be changing pending clarification of funding from Welsh Government. Yeah, OK, because I think that's important because obviously they need to look at all this now in depth. Um, so we need to put some comment forward. OK, so do we have any other recommendations that we'd like to put forward? And, and just to endorse really around uh, community safety and um, Cadexton House um, about actually looking, you know, really having a look outside the box around the service and what's needed there and, and an alternative provision. OK, so are we happy to accept this? Uh, um, uh, sorry. <coughs> <coughs> sorry. Are we to accept this and put forward the, uh, the, the, the recommendations that have been brought up today? Yes. OK. Uh, yeah. Can I just double check on the, <clears throat> do you want also the recommendation around the cost, not having a cost pressure around the uh, B&Bs as well, or just as a note in the reference go in? I, I think you need to keep it in there until we actually have clarification as to how much it is changing oh, okay. by but probably just to sort of note that there are ongoing discussions with welsh government so that i wouldn't want to have it taken totally out um until we clarify the you know the exact amount okay so just to double check chair we've got the recommendations around cost pressures on b and b at the moment um community safety and caddickston house as well is that correct? Uh, yes, I, I believe yeah. that is correct. OK, lovely. Thank, thank you. OK, thank you. So uh, item number 11 then, initial capital programme proposals 2022 to 23 to 2026 to 27. OK, thank you, Jay. Um, again, with, with capital the same as revenue, we don't have any indication as yet what the settlement will be um, for next year. In Appendix 1, we have got some schemes outlined in there, which we which we sort of include every year. So there's always an allowance for um, DFGs and the housing improvement programme is included in there, which ties in with the approved um, housing business plan. So in addition to that, um, one bid has been received from this committee, which is for 60,000 relating to safer streets. So at this time, um, because there's uncertainty with the level of funding, no actual bids have been approved to go forward at this stage. But um, if members would like to make any recommendation or any comments to support that bid that's included, um, this can be referred on to corporate performance and resources. And um, again, eventually the uh, capital proposals will be uh, taken to cabinet in February and final approval in um, March by council. But as I say, it's, it's a similar situation to revenue. You know, we, we don't have an indication yet as to how much money is available. So uh, we haven't been able to approve anything at this stage. So it's, it's for consultation. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you. Do we have any questions on that? OK, so the recommendation for that is that we consider the initial capital programme proposal and forward its recommendations to Corporate Performance and Resource Scrutiny Committee as the lead scrutiny committee. Are we happy to see that? OK, I can see one nodding and one thumb up, so I'm, I'm taking that as, a, as, as happy. So item number 12 then, Carolyn, the initial housing revenue Sorry, account. Chair. Yep. Very quickly, in terms of um, the recommendations to go to corporate performance, are there any recommendations to go from the committee or are we are the committee just happy then with as as it is? Well, I asked if, if we were happy with that recommendation and we haven't. Nobody has no. actually come up with okay. anything else. So no, that, that's fine. Just wanted to double check, Chair. That's OK. OK. Thanks. All right. No problem. So um, 
Carolyn, item number 12, please. Initial okay. housing revenue account. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so the first part of the report shows the amended budget for 2021. Um, there's a large change from uh, the initial um, budget being set at 25,000 surplus, and, and we're now proposing it changed to a deficit of 11 million, obviously, which sounds like a large jump. Um, but at the end of 2021, the HRA reserve was a lot higher than projected due to underspends in last year. Um, therefore, in order to bring down the level of the reserve back in line with the projected level shown in the business plan, um, there will need to be an increased revenue expenditure this year. So how we're doing this is we're going to increase the revenue contributions to fund capital expenditure. This will obviously increase expenditure, which we will then draw down from the reserve and the reserve will then be brought back into the, the level that we had planned it to be. Um, by making these contributions to capital, just to make you aware, what this will do is it'll mean that we haven't got to raise as many uh, loans. So it will it will actually save on the, um, the loan charges. So it, it is beneficial. Uh, these are the small changes detailed in the report. Um, and I say one of them is a, is a change in the bad debt provision, uh, which we are also reducing um, as the actual position um, forecast for the year doesn't require such a large uh, increase in the bad debt provision. Uh, the report then goes on to detail the proposed budget for 22-23, which is detailed in Appendix 1. So just to point out that at this stage, the level of rent increase is not yet known as the rent policy has not been received from Welsh Government yet. Um, we've, we're looking at net growth required uh, in the, um, for the budget for next year, which is detailed in paragraph 2.12, uh, the largest being um, increase in borrowing costs. So even though we are reducing it, there still will be a need because we will be um, increasing spend in the capital programme next year. Um, so again, at this stage, this report is, is for your comments. Uh, anything you'd like to make can be referred to corporate performance. And then the final report will go to Cabinet um, in February. But also at that time, the um, housing business plan will be taken to Cabinet and they'll both go to Council um, in March. So as I say, when it goes back to Cabinet, it will be sort of in tandem with the housing business plan. Um, happy to take any uh, questions, Jay. OK, so does anybody have any questions or additional recommendations? That's a big fat silence, so I'll take yeah. that as a no. Are we happy to go with the recommendations in the report that the uh, amended housing revenue account budget for 2021 and 22, as set out in Appendix 1, be noted? Yeah. Yes, um, Chair. The second recommendation is that the initial housing revenue account budget proposal for 2022 to 23 be considered and any recommendations be passed to the scrutiny committee, corporate performance and resources as the lead scrutiny committee. Yes, Chair. OK, thank you. Well, Carolyn, you got through that in record time. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Chair. That's OK. Thank you. No problem. Thank you for coming. Bye. Bye. OK, so the next item on our agenda will be item number four, which is the Civil Protection Unit update, and this will be done by Debbie, if you'd like to come through. Hello, thank you very much for um, for letting me come on to the committee tonight and, and give you a presentation. I'm not sure if my presentation is going to be put up or you want me to share it, so Mark, should I put it up? Yeah, yeah go ahead, Debbie, if you can share it, that'll be great. Oh, come on. <laughs> Okay, can you see that? I can't see if yet. Yeah. Okay, yes, great. Thank you very much. Okay, so my name is Debbie Spargo. I'm Principal Civil Protection Officer at The Vale. Um, and I'm going to give you a presentation and update on um, civil protection, what we've been doing for the last uh, just, uh, just under two years, because um, I don't think I've been back since then. Uh, so I just wanted to give you the basis for where we come from. So the Civil Contingencies Act is a statutory duty on the local authority um, as a category one responder. And under that act, there are these um, six duties uh, which are on all category one responders. Um, and there is an, another one on the local authority, which is to provide um, business advice, business continuity advice to businesses. So that's a standalone local authority one. So that's the legal basis for where, where we come from and why we do this as in the authority. So the update, 
um, I wanted to talk to you about the COVID-19. Um, I can't really go any further without talking about this because for the last sort of since 2020, March 2020, we've been engrossed in it, not only as a unit, but as a council. So um, we started um, our response in early 2020, uh, March 2020, before the lockdown came, um, when we had a, um, a gold meeting, which is SLT plus the leader and the deputy leader. And we talked <clears throat> about setting our priorities in case this did come into fruition, because at the time it was bubbling around the outside of where it was going. It wasn't had been declared a world pandemic. And then, as we know, on the 23rd of March last year, we had a lockdown and we've, we've continued since then, as you know, in, in the thick of it. Um, so as, as a council, we used our business continuity critical services list to prioritise the services. So the, it, it was a little bit chaotic because nobody would have expected this kind of thing to have hit in the way that it did. Um, but we did have some plans to go by. So we did use that framework to set those priorities. Um, we had a big impact. The COVID had a big impact on our IT infrastructure and uh, very pleased to say that now we're in a very good position, indeed, sitting on these meetings now virtually still being able to carry on with our business and serving our communities. Um, the gold meetings were every, so for the first I'd say six to eight months, every two uh, two a week, uh, every week, um, and sometimes late into the night. So a lot of people working quite late. Um, and then um, we sort of pared them down to one a week and they're still ongoing at the moment. And we now don't have them every two weeks. We've just changed into um, every three weeks in line with the Welsh Government's review. Um, so we're going to be looking at, at doing that. And obviously we don't know what's happening with that at the moment, but I'll come on to that as I go through the uh, the presentation. So as a council, we started off, we set up a PPE store, something we've never done before in the, on the scale that we did it to support social care um, and the social care sector to make sure that they could continue their vital work and also have our own procedures in place to make sure things like waste could continue in, in a safe environment and, and to be able to make sure our communities had, you know, uh, proper services from the council to the best of our ability um, with what was going on. Um, we supported Cardiff and the Vale Health Board in a number of ways, and one of them was by uh, with vaccination centres, um, and we're still we're still ongoing with that now. Um, you know now that the vaccination centre at the time it was a testing centre, now it's a vaccination centre at Home View, at Home View, um, and that's ongoing support that we provided. We helped the Welsh Government with food parcels and set a helpline up. Um, with C1V and our, from our performance team. Community safety, I've heard you mention them a couple of times tonight. Um, maybe behind the scenes, as you might not have known, but they had a massive role in this in terms of with the JET team, the Joint Enforcement Team, have um, been able to, to support the community. Places like Barry Island, Ogmore, we all know, got really inundated with people during this time. Um, the housing teams, Mike's already said about homelessness and what we what went on there. Um, enhanced cleaning um, and security of our buildings, support for schools, libraries, our play team, we've you know, done some excellent work and we are continuing to work on that across the Vale. And we, we did step into recovery for a very short period, but it didn't last that long because we ended up going back into response then. So also um, we have something called the South Wales Local Resilience Forum. That forum is... Um, it's for category one responders, so that come under the Civil Contingencies Act that I showed you earlier. Um, and in South Wales, there's 19 category one responders, and over together with the category two, there's over 30 uh, category one and category two responders. The um, the forum is hosted by the Vale of Glamorgan Council, so Miles Penter is the vice chair of that um, forum, and um, the the co coordinator sits in my team. So the response to that has been um, ongoing as well, and it's still ongoing. That That is a multi-agency forum, so look to all partners and how we could support each other. Um, they stood up their strategic coordinating group, their SCG, quite quickly. And again, it was two meetings a week in the first instance, sometimes going into three, um, looking at multi-agency issues across the area including Welsh Government officials and and some of the armed forces. So there was quite a lot of military aid to the civil community um, requests done for support. And you might have heard on the news recently that the army is supporting the Welsh Ambulance Service. That would have been done through that mechanism. 
Um, the uh, they coordinated in the early days the testing sites. So you know there was a lot of testing going on at the time that's now changed into they're still testing obviously sites, but they're now are more more around vaccination, and um, also supported with ma um, of management of excess deaths, which supported the health board liaison with through, and liaison with Welsh government and public health Wales. Um, also with enforcement and the JET teams, I mentioned them earlier, but that came under the multi-agency umbrella. And, a foc and we focus very much on local issues within the seven local authorities that sit within South Wales LRF. So for that, I think you'd remember maybe, you know, Ogmore from last year, where we had nearly a riot on down there because of the, so that they, we had put a lot of targeted resources down there then with community safety and the police and the JET teams working together. So it was a really good example of multi-agency working. That work continues, and there are still meetings going on at the moment, um, again, in line with the Welsh Government uh, review. Every every three weeks um, might, might be changing now as we speak, um, but that will be going, the, those meetings are ongoing to look at what the picture across the whole of Wales and do some horizon scanning. So that's the, the COVID-19 pandemic response. I don't know if you want to wait till I finish or if you've got any questions, ask, but maybe wait, maybe wait till I finish because otherwise we might get trailed off into one into one subject. So um, I would recommend we wait until the okay. presentation. You, we may get involved too much too much, as you are as okay. you are thinking there, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you, Chair. Okay, so despite just Despite being involved in the in the pandemic in the way that we were in the way that we've coordinated the council's response, we still managed to do some normal kind of work, and we've got an emergency plan frame, re review framework, and we've managed to review in that time these plans. So the emergency fuel arrangements, the Barry Chemical Complex external plan, which is the Comus uh, plan, uh, our contacts directory, a snow plan, the Vale of Flood Plan, Stray Horse and Livestock Arrangements, Rest Centre Plan and Recovery Plan. So all of those things have been updated and reviewed, um, some fortuitously so, I will say, as we come on to the next slide, because we had to use some of those. So the, the, we do we, we cover 24-7, 365 days a year. We have a duty officer on call um, that would respond to any call, <coughs> any, um, any call from the local the emergency services or a, a response from the council. Um, so ongoing ongoing COVID response. Veil flooding, which is nearly coming up to a year actually, because it was the 23rd of December last year that um, we had that awful rain um, and we had some major flooding in some parts of the, the Vale, particularly around Dennis Powys area. We've had we've had numerous um, travellers this year in the Vale um, that have mainly been around the docks offices sites. Um, and we've also had to deal with not only our normal legislation, but an overlay of COVID guidance from the Welsh Government on that. So we've had to be really mindful of all of that when we've dealt with that. We had some beached cargo wash-ups and some big containers out at sea that washed up on our shores. We've had some bomb scare, we've had a cliff fall, some stray horses on the road, the vessels in the old Barry Harbour, which I'm sure you may be aware of, where we've um, we had to remove those uh, vessels, and it was quite a big operation. I coordinated that and making sure that that was um, done in the best and um, cheapest way and the best way f for all of us, really. Um, and that came about because we did have um, the MCA, so the Marine and Coast Guard Agency. Actually, there were some pollution incidents going on in the harbour, in the old harbour from some of the vessels. And we were um, called, I think it was just before Easter, um, to say that there was bad weather forecast. One of the, the vessels had broken, looks as if it was going to break free of its moorings. And as the harbour authority, the local authority, were responsible for that. So we had to do some really quick work around that. Um, and then, as you know, that sort of went on for the rest of this year until we, we managed to dispose of those vehicles, vessels. And then um, I mentioned we we updated the fuel plan and luckily we had the fuel supply panic. So there wasn't actually a fuel shortage. It just appeared that there was. Um, and we, we were able to use that that some of that plan, even though it's a national plan, to be able to do that. Other things that we've done in this in this last 18 months then, uh, I chair the Advance Adv Safety Advisory Group. And this group has become really important during the pandemic because it was the focus for lots of people who wanted to put lots of events on. 
Um, so lots of those events were taken to SLT Gold to see if they, you know, we were going to support them or we weren't, what was going to happen with our own events. And also be mind, really mindful of um, the legislation and the COVID uh, regulations coming out of Welsh Government around events. Um, that that panel now meets every month. Um, because, so that was that's been ramped up. So because we had so many events coming in, we had to have a really consistent approach with everything. Protective security and preparedness group is something that we've just set up this year and there's actually new protect duty coming out. Um, it's just just gone through consultation now and that places a number of um, duties around mainly counter-terrorism on the council. Um, so we're looking at, we set that group up, it's, it's uh, directorate wide, so it's council wide, but really good support from it and that feeds in then into the Vale Cardiff in the Vale contest board which then feel, feeds into Contest Cymru. So the whole of that is is really looking um, quite good at the moment in what we're doing. And uh, we're working really closely with Cardiff on that as well. So well, we've done some new guidance as well this year. So we've done the Community Flood Plan and Extreme Weather Guidance. Um, and that's been placed on our website now and sent out to all community councils. All of the councillors should have um, had a copy of it. And it's mainly trying to help to build community resilience across the Vale for any kind of extreme weather event that we get. Um, so it's 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 looking at what what we can do as an organisation, but also what you can do as individuals and your community to make you a bit more resilient. Um, we've just uh, um, looking at some guidance for some information on Barry Old Harbour to go onto the website. And um, we've just relocated the sandbag supply from Court Road down to the docks offices. So we're just in the process of finalising that before we release any details on procedures um, and, and processes around that. Um, but they've all been successfully done this week. I think there's lighting going in at the end of this week. Um, and then we should have the signed off procedures and policy next week to be able to send out to anybody before Christmas and anything that I hope is not going to happen this year. So that's the end of my presentation, but I don't know if um, you've got any questions or um, you'd like to me to expand on anything. Thank you very much, Debbie. I do have one question before I bring Councillor Nugent Finn in, and it's to do with the, the boats in the Old Harbour. Um, as you are most probably aware, there was absolute outcry over social media regarding this. There were accusations being thrown around against the council left, right and centre. But one of them that sticks in mind more than anything is that there was a few accusations of the council acting illegally. So I, I, I would like to just know the kind of procedure you went through in order to get those boats removed. OK, so um, the, bo the boats have been in there for some time and there have, there have been problems. We've tried to get hold of the owners. We've placed notices on those boats. Um, and we were it was, the hardest thing was trying to find the owners of them. Mm. We did imagine. manage. It took, it took nearly three or four months to track down who we actually thought owned the boats. And then we have to go through a process of writing to them people and making sure that that's done properly. In the interim, the Marine and Coast Guard Agency were um, very concerned about the vessels. Um, one from a, there was a bit of pollution going on, but it wasn't a major pollution incident. We had the NRW, the Natural Resources Wales Pollution Officers out to have a look at it. Um, and be, but it was a sort of it, it was causing a bit of distress, I think, in the actual area. Um, the main concern for them was the vessel was going to break free. It was going to break up and it was going to disrupt the pilotage of the Bristol Channel. And if that had happened, the council as the Harbour Authority would have been held responsible because it was in our um, in our harbour, which is, is and we are the Harbour Authority. The, um, the process that we went through was that there was a court case. Um, so we, we, we took action to try and get hold of it. We tried to get hold of the owners. Uh, we didn't have, as far as I know, we didn't have any um, any luck with that in terms of them having a dialogue with us. Um, there was a court uh, case against them uh, in the magistrate's court, which was then referred on. It was held back, and, and we, I think it was the 7th of October this year, this year that we actually went to court with them. But at that time, the vessels were impounded so they're legally impounded by the court to the to the harbour authority, 
um, and because we, we were able to get to dispose of the vessels then we did look at a number of ways of disposing them and it's it's not been an easy it's not been an easy task but um, it was the best option in terms of the um, the actual way the, the state of the vessels were, which weren't that seaworthy and actually then you know having all the costs associated with that so this this was the best option in terms of and we were lucky to be able to do what we did to be honest with you so i hope that answers your question chair well yeah it, i didn't really have a question because i wasn't really That's... doubting the legality of the procedures i just wanted to ask that for the people who have been doing it on on social media so that there was some clarification for them okay. and they could see the reasoning behind everything so thank you very very much i'll bring okay. councillor nugent finn in now Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much, Debbie. A comprehensive over a shot of a hell of a lot of work, so thanks very much for condensing it as much as you did. Um, following on from, from uh, um, Councillor Collins, actually, with regards to the boat, yeah, it was it was such a negative impact for Verlega Morgan, you know. Uh, it, was, it was everywhere because they were, they, you know, they made it look really attractive with all the beautiful lights and everything, so we were seen as the big, well, the Verlega Morgan was seen as the big bad, you know. So what you know, in terms of everything you've described, which is, you know, court costs, massive impact on, on officers' time and the negative impact on the Verdigan Morgan, how are we going to mitigate this for the future? Because they just appeared, didn't they? You know, what are we going to do to make sure this doesn't happen again? So what, what needs to happen now in the future is that we've just written a procedure um, to go on the website, um, which um, says that um, Barry Harbour is not an operational harbour and we don't have any moorings in there. So we're directing people who want to come in there with moorings to more of the vessels that mm. we don't we don't accept um, vessels in there to moor. If they mm. do come in, then we need certain information off them. So they would have to provide us with information and we it could result in legal action where we would put notices straight on the boat mm. and then look to move them within a, a, a sort of time frame if we couldn't get, get hold of the of the owners of the of the vessels. Mm. I think the other thing that needs um doing is there's a um a piece of legislation, I think it's the Barry harbour act i think or barry mm. harbour legislation which is specific to that harbour which needs to be reviewed and updated and okay. i think that's something that miles um is looking at we're going to be looking at that early in the new year to get some professional um help with that in terms of the maritime law because it's quite complex yes so um yeah. we're going to be looking at of, of all of that and then i'm sure mm. miles will be bringing future reports um to get full counsel and to yourselves about exactly mm. what's happening but in the interim we are putting procedures in place in, including informing c1v if they get calls for this right. i think one mm. of the biggest things is people mm. say that it's a harbor of refuge mm. and there's no such thing as a harbor of refuge um, because if you're in difficulty in on a vessel, you should phone the Coast Guard mm. on, on their channel. They've got a special channel if you're out at sea. Mm. Um, and they will direct you to mm. the, the best port to go to. It's mm. exactly the same if you think an aircraft. Yeah. If, if, if you're an aircraft in distress, they would contact um, air traffic control and they would tell them where to go. You can't just go in anywhere. So... There, that's the bet that so with that procedure now is in is in them um, that and as soon as we get that speech, we're just waiting for the rail translation yeah. and make sure that's circulated to all of you as well yeah. so that you have yeah. that'd be really helpful thank you debbie okay. and then just just very on the flood plan great that we've got guidance on the website fantastic so, um, sandbags are relocated <clears throat> you know in absolute dire emergency what's the best way we can direct the public or business services um, you know, will there be a contact number? There'll be an assigned officer to just direct people to the website. You know, I'd rather do a little bit more if I can. So, so it, once we, um, once once the procedure's in place, what we do with the sandbags is that um, we obviously monitor the weather, we monitor um, what's going on, and we have um, we have a, access to a specialist website with the, with the Met Office um, and also our own our own officers um, from highways. Um, and we, if we felt it was going to be rain coming in the way that it did, we would trigger the sandbags to, um, to be opened. Mm. We don't give sandbags out all year, and okay. we don't give them out just in case. Mm. So, um, you know, I know, I know. Recently, we've had some people turning up for sandbags yeah. um, on on the on the on the strength of maybe Barra Brith or the storm Barra that hit, mm. but it didn't actually hit the veil. So on that on that occasion, we wouldn't have opened. Mm sandbag mm. store um mm. residents can purchase sandbags um looking for some um 
some suppliers at the moment where I can put them onto the website as well. Okay. Um, and and the policy is that 50, up to a maximum of 15 sandbags per property. Yeah. Um, but again, as soon as that signed off, which should be early next week, I'll circulate that as well so you all know the procedure. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cave, you're, you're next. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, thank you for that um, a really interesting presentation, Debbie. Uh, a very difficult time for um, everybody. Um, yes, the flooding. Um, I'm, I just wanted to say we have in the Rural Vale already established uh, a couple of points where sandbags are now readily available. And that's great because, you know, in, in the last flood, I think we had to get them delivered. Um, you know, it's all time, isn't it? And, um, you know, we went, went round and found out who needed them and so on and so forth. But to have them actually at the locations where they're needed or very close by is, a, a you know, is a, a real asset for us, I think, especially in the rural Vale. Um, but what I'd like to speak to you about is one of the sort of ongoing problems that we have in the rural areas, which is about field runoff. So quite often um, houses are put at risk because there's a uh, flooding from the uh, massive field runoff. And I wonder if that's um, something you could give us some information about. Okay. Um, I, I don't, it's not something, I mean, when, when we deal with a, a flooding event, I mean, obviously that would happen because it comes off the fields. Um, I'd, I'd have to speak to um, Clive Moon, to be honest, to see if they were um, any hot spots around the Vale that they've picked up, the flood risk team. Um, I mean, what what I would say to people is if you know that there's there is this, this is this, this community um, guidance that we've done, um, Councillor Cave might assist because it can give you some pointers and ideas for that. It's, it's, it's about being really aware in your own community of where the flooding can come from. So, you know, in the Vale, we're very fortunate that we haven't got a lot of huge main rivers, you know, but what we have got is is, is fluvial flooding on a, it's, it's flash flooding on a very um, speedy scale and we don't know where it's going to hit. So, you know, if you look at Bridge End, they know that they've got their main rivers and they they can build around those. We, we This can hit anywhere over the Vale, you know, and I've been in this job for 30 years and I've dealt with flooding in Boverton, in Lantwit, you know, in in uh, Dennis Powys, in Caddick since 2007, you know, so and in Wemvo, it's it can just hit wherever. wherever. So we haven't got a, a plan that can actually just say, OK, that particular area. But if in your area, you know that that particular lane floods, you know, and if there's a if it's somebody's private land or it might be it might be able to give you some help in terms of, you know, is there a way they can divert the water course or is that if is it, it says it belong to natural resources Wales. So it might be worth looking at what you're talking about now, if it's a specific area with Clive Moon's team to see if that is something or if it is private land and how what advice we could give then. I don't oh, that, know if that's helpful yes, at all. That's, but. that's very helpful, Debbie, because I've obviously been dealing with highways um, for, well, five years now um, about um, some consistent field runoff that we have in um, the rural vale in the ward that I represent. And it isn't, um, it, it is, as you describe, um, that, you know, we, need, we have heavy rain. But here we know as soon as we have heavy rain, the roads will flood and the, the houses at the end of the village will become... Uh, uh, very liable to flooding and so if I you know if I could ask <coughs> that we could in some way work with the, the team that would be very helpful. Okay I'll speak to them about that and then uh, you know it might be just that we can give them guidance some information on on flood um, property protection and stuff like that because if you live somewhere like that I mean, unfortunately, there's there's not a lot we can do about rain and stuff like that it's, it's you know and if it is going to flood then, you know, it's, it's worth looking at what's the best options because sometimes sandbags, they, they, they work initially, but they're not always the best solution for this. I'll speak to Clive and I'll come back to you, Councillor Cave. Okay. Councillor... Councillor Cave, oh, are you, yes, I can see she's lowered her hand now. So, Councillor Brooks, please. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Debbie, for, uh, for for the updated report. Um, 
<laughs> it's it's been a very challenging year for you yet again um with all the other things going on plus obviously you've got the covid 19 response ongoing um and really i suppose my question is around that is obviously we've got the uh the omicron variant at the moment uh ramping up uh big time so really it's just you know, your staff are under a huge amount of pressure with all the the ordinary, when I say ordinary issues that you deal with, is, you know, this is ramping the COVID response up again. It's about those, uh, what you know, what are the plans then for, obviously, we've got the Christmas and New Year period and things could change up very quick, last minute, uh, I feel at the moment. It's about sort of, I assume you are prepared, but it's sort of how are you going to cope? Obviously, you've got your staffing levels and people off for Christmas and New Year. Yes. Yeah, so obviously look at um making sure that we've got staffing on anyway um i think you know in, in critical service areas over over the christmas period i think obviously with the omicron virus it's it's about making sure that we get the message in right and we're following the public health and welsh government guidelines i mean today i know that um I don't know if it's officially been announced but i think i saw on the news that there's going to be or there was a a thread on one of the news websites that there's going to be some um restrictions put in so around six six people in a household and you know four four household bubbles and so that we are going to be seeing some of that kind of thing back um i suspect that after after the new year depending what happens is that um it will we, we could go further into that, depending what's going on at the time. I think there's so much uncertainty at the moment. I think for me, the biggest thing is is to make sure that you're following all the guidance, you're staying safe, you, you're not mixing unless you have to. Um, and, you know, uh, I think people, you know, I've heard so many times people say, you know, well, it's just flu. It's just like flu, you know, we deal with that every year. But the problem is that we don't know what COVID is. So with, with flu, it's been here since the Spanish flu. We've had all these decades and decades of being able to monitor public health and all of the great things they do. COVID is new. We don't know what we don't know what this variant is going to do. So I suspect, and I might be wrong, that that this is going to be going on for the next few years. Every Christmas, every winter, we're going to be hitting these kind of variants that are coming out. And because it's it's mutating all the time. And um, so in terms of our resilience of staff, I think we've looked at that as best we can. I mean, obviously we can't, um, you know, we can't sort of uh, do anything if, if we have people going off with Omicron or having to, but there are pl plans in place for that. Um, I can assure you that the when we'll do the best we can as a service to make sure that we've got the resilience in place. No, that's lovely. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, Mike, do you want to come in on that? It, it was only just to add to, to Debbie's comment there about the planning. Um, I, I, from a housing and building services perspective, I, I can uh, advise that we've 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 taken our risk assessments. Obviously, we are required in law to risk assess our premises and and our practices. Um, those have been dusted off again, given the rising numbers, um, and together then, uh, obviously, in constant contact with Public Health Wales. Um, to ensure that those risk assessments remain valid and up to date. And it, obviously, it is a fast moving situation and some of the easing perhaps in some of our public buildings or our, our, our uh, sheltered housing schemes, clearly we're looking at that and obviously wish to uh, um, ensure that our public spaces are as safe as possible. Thanks, Mike. OK, Councillor Hanks. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Debbie, for your presentation. Um, just a clarification, really. I was just wondering, you mentioned the flood plan and snow arrangements separately, but then I, you also got um, a note on community flood plan and extreme weather. So are we working under the community flood plan and, and extreme weather? Is that incorporating the snow as well, please? Community flood plan and extreme weather is a public facing document which is to build f for um, communities and uh, community councils and anybody to use. The um, flood, the Vega Morgan flood plan and the Vega Morgan snow plan are internal documents that we would use as a procedure for flooding. So they are slightly different in that they obviously do reflect each other, but the the community 
it does it does what you're asking sally is it does actually um it does cover so the extreme weather does cover f snow and sun if we ever get it and and anything nice like that but um yeah but they are they're slightly different because one is a public facing and the other is an internal document on how we would respond as a, as a council okay thank you very much councillor bird hi i um, just a uh, uh, an assumption i always assumed that field runoff was dealt with by nrw I don't know, am I right in assuming that or not? Because any issues we I've ever had as a farmer um, have always been controlled by NRW. I would think they are more than the, I mean, I know Councillor Cave mentioned the highway um, authority and it would flood the highways, but I, I think it is, it's a sort of combination, isn't it, of the NRW. I agree with you, I think it is them. Um, the reason I mentioned Clive um, Moon's team is because they do the um, flood risk for the Vale and they, they can pick up hot spots, although it's on a national basis. And um, one of the things I would think is if you are getting lots of field runoff, then that could become a hotspot for your local community. And it's about dealing with that locally. But yeah, I do think that is right, Councillor Bird. Yeah, I, th I think, it, as you say, it is a combination of both because I know um, I've worked with Clive on, on issues where um flooding of highways is an issue but if it, it i always thought it was flooding of highways if it's runoff going into someone's private property i was assuming it was nrw then but yeah. it's 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 quite complicated it's quite confusing actually um but i must admit i have worked with um clive on issues where we've had um constant runoff of roads caused by lack of maintenance of ditches and things like that and and Quite often, um, it's it's easier to to go directly if you see what I mean, rather than through the council. Try and find the landowner and see if there's a solution outside of the council, because sometimes it's just a a, um, a culvert needs unblocking or a drain needs cleaning, a ditch needs cleaning. And um, I don't know, Christine, if if you've got particular fields that are constantly causing problems, it, do you know who owns them? Chair, I don't know whether you're happy for me to come in and, and answer uh, this question. As I said, um, uh, Councillor Bird, we've been dealing with this uh, locally for about uh, five years now. And I don't know whether it's um, some uh, change in um, the way these fields are being farmed um, or what is happening. But there does seem to be a great deal of reluctance for highways and it what happens is it floods the highway so the fields run directly onto the highway which then run down a hill and then they run into the village and the and the road the highway in question is actually turned into a river and once the rain has subsided the debris from the fields the stone the rocks the mud um, is left on the highway um, the drains silt up, and they, the council have to. We have to come along and constantly clear the gullies and the and the uh, drains. I just and want it to does seem that there's just a reluctance for anybody, the owners of the field, the farmers, um, highways. It just seems that there's a great reluctance for anybody to take responsibility and do something about it. Can I give you a little tip then? Try. Can. Try. NRW, if you know the landowners, try NRW because NRW have the, the, the powers basically to cause the farmers a lot of problems, um, whereas the council has nothing like that. Um, they can restrict their payments, their single farm payments and stuff like that. So I would suggest that you try NRW as well as um, the Highway Authority. Thank you for that, Councillor. I certainly will make that as a, as a suggestion going forward, but it would be uh, very useful to be in touch with Clive's team because it is a hot spot and uh, it would be great to have um, like a backup plan just in case NRW do what everybody else has done so far and say, well, it's nothing really to do with us. But thank you for that. I think just on that, um, it might be worth looking at that guidance then, Councillor Cave, because about making the the, res, the communities really resilient and, um, you know, it, looking at what you can do as a community um, to try and alleviate 
obviously if there's flooding there all the time it's quite stressful for individuals and, and it causes a lot of anxiety as well so yeah I, I think that um, trying to look at that build some community and, and maybe if we can get the farmers and things on board maybe you can work as one rather than seem to be one against another if that is the case. That, that would be wonderful as you say it's so stressful you know I know people that when the weather forecast is for rain they sit up in vigilance because they're in fear that their homes are going to flood. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. So, OK. Oh, and um, Councillor Cave, I will concur with Councillor Bird's um, advice to you. I work for DEFRA myself. So if you were, uh, that's my day job. <laughs> if you if you speak to NRW, they'll get in touch with Rural Payments Wales if there are any further issues and they can talk about the single farm payments and um, things like that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I would talk to them because they've got the powers to do anything. They're quite persuasive when they're talking. They're very persuasive <laughs> when they want to be, yes. <laughs> OK, so... Um, Unless we've got any other questions, um, then I think that is it for this item. And all I want to say now, Debbie, is thank you very much to you and your team. You have certainly had a challenging time of it since March of last year, and you've done a remarkably good job, and you've all done remarkably well. So thank you very, very much. Well, thank you. And thank you for letting me come to the committee and, and, and tell you about what we do. I appreciate it. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Bird, you've still got your hand raised. Ah, there we go. <laughs> okay, so item number five is the disabled facilities adaptations, and I believe Phil is going to be taking this. If you'd like to go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, I hope it's okay. Um, would you mind if I turn my camera off? Only because the this end of the village has had its internet knocked out. And I'm currently on a MiFi device, so I'm trying to reduce my streaming. Would that be OK? Of course. OK, you don't want to look at me anyway. OK, I'll try and be as uh, quick as possible. <laughs> um, this one just got six, six slides to run through, so I'm just going to share the slides now, if that's OK. OK. Everybody see that? Is that OK? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah we can uh, see that. OK, great. Just going to run through a um, bit of an update on the, the disabled facilities adaptation. So as most of you know, I'm Phil Chappell, the operational manager for regeneration. So the disabled facilities team kind of sits in our economy team. Um, it's been there since 2012 and um, it's one of three adaptation teams within the council. So um, probably worth me just giving you a little bit of a background for what the what the team does, what the grants for. Um, We've obviously got a statutory duty to consider kind of uh, and approve adaptations for disability facilities grants um, in private homes. And um, there's a need to identify um, whether the adaptations are kind of reasonable and practical. So those are the two words we use quite a lot, reasonable and practical for a house. So obviously we're working with new houses, old houses, all sorts, and, and, and um, whatever we do has to be sort of reasonable and practical. Um, they fund the adaptation of privately owned homes, allow residents to live in independently as, as, for as long as possible. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. And across Wales, the, the statutory limit is £36,000 and the Vale offers a top up of that uh, discretionary amount of £60,000, which I think is around the second or third um, most generous um, amount in Wales for the, for the discretionary element. And, and it's fair to say it works differently in different areas. You know, we've we've got um, in, in the Vale, we offer something called a grants agency service, where if you're um, an individual who needs an adaptation, we will manage it for you. Um, and there's a percentage fee. I think it's, it's around 15 percent of the, the cost that get administered, you know, to administer it, oversee the building work, do the designs, implement the scheme um, for that. But in some counties, they may just issue a grant if you want to deliver the scheme yourself. So that option's available for residents of the Vale we can issue grants um, directly to people, um, householders uh, who want to deliver the adaptations themselves. Um, and, and I think we've, we've got a one thing we're always doing, I suppose, is managing the expectations of residents in that, you know, we go in going, right, what does this child or adult need in order to help them live better quality lives and live longer in their homes, whereas they may, you know, and th that thing, that, that adaptation isn't always 
you know, fitting in with, you know, I would like this end of the room to look like this, or I need a bathroom upstairs or any, you know, so it, it's about what's practical um, and reasonable. And we obviously haven't got a huge amount of money to to play with there. Um, obviously, residents have got the option of topping it up if they've got any funding. So if they, they want a different finish or a, um, an extension, you know, sometimes we, we do fund extensions, but they may want something else we can we can offer that as well. Um, one thing to point out, I suppose, at the moment, means and large, ad large adaptations are means tested. Um, and I've, you know, I've only been doing this job a few years, and, and there's a, for me, in some cases, it doesn't seem fair um, that where we're ruling people out. I think the the demand for DFG was dropping over a period before because the means testing was getting more stringent, so people were being means tested out of it uh, before they even got to the council. Um, you know, so I was thinking, it, for example, you you could be a, a couple in a house and you have a mortgage and you're both working and one of you becomes disabled um if but you have no savings the other spouse continues working to pay the mortgage but if you're if you're then disabled and have to leave your job technically you're ruled out of this so that was one of the, the standout things for me it, just, it didn't seem like a fair system so for, from that point of view because you think it could be any of us in that in that situation um so owner occupiers landlords tenants can can apply for this um this 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 funding as long as there's a disabled person living in the property. Um, slide three is a bit of an update on kind of performance to date. Um, we awarded 56 grants um, in 2021. I'll go on to talk about COVID in a minute, but um, I think I think it means, for example, 21, 22, we're probably going to be spending about 65, 75 percent of our kind of capital allocation um the the target was modified um up from about 200 to um 350 as a result of covid um and we've been averaging about 340 days um other departments and other other teams you know social services will come in and do other work on adaptations and i put i put a little note there about care and repair delivering many works and i've got family members that have had support through care and repair where you know, they've come out after a hip operation or a knee operation and care and repair have gone around, put some grab rails everywhere, put a little step in. And, you know, that's a that's a kind of a low cost solution. We, we fund them through various grants and enable. They they are a really good service. I can't rate them enough, actually, for what they do. They can go in within a very short space of time and, you know, really make a difference to the kind of day to day and quality of life there. Um, so just a quick one about COVID. COVID-19 COVID challenges um, for us were kind of new ways of working. You know, everything was on hold from the start. Um, people weren't able to go into homes. I, you know, some of our... Oh, I lost you. Sorry, you lost me for a moment then, didn't you? No, you're all right. Sorry, I said the internet was bad. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm just saying about that that slide there that that it was new ways of working. Everything was kind of on hold from the start, and and because they weren't able to go into homes, many of the DFG were diverted into the emergency business support that we were delivering around COVID grants for businesses and um, discretionary grants for individuals. So um, I mean, it was great that they were able to do that, but we we weren't able to do our day to day business because a lot of our clients were vulnerable shielding were reluctant rightfully reluctant to have people in their houses you know if you're if you're if you're um you're not you're disabled um and also we also had furloughed staff in construction and the supply chains to construction so um we we've had a bit of a backlog of requests um from that but where possible we go in and do adaptations you know we we did prevent people um being admitted to hospital um because of those adaptations so I, you know i was pleased that that could happen but it has been a challenging time through covid um coming out i say coming out of covid we're not coming out of covid are we going but it seems like we're going back into it every six weeks but i think post the initial covid challenges um we've we've got a bit of an issue with the availability and cost of building materials we run our we run all of our contractors off a framework and the prices have um gone up a lot of our special specialist specialist kind of uh, mobility equipment comes from the eu so um that in some cases has been a, a challenge so what we're doing is working with some qs's uh, quantity surveyors to unlock this for us to kind of agree a temporary uplift in our frameworks because the the bottom line is contractors were not making enough money to even cover their costs in some cases where they were where they had low profit um, margins um, 
you know, I think overall the cost has been about 25% over, over across the board. You know, some of the real clangers are things like steel has gone up um, from £1,800 a tonne to £2,500 a tonne, you know, it's 38%. Concrete's up 15%. Aggregate's about 75 And um, I can't remember what the figure for wood is, but it's quite a lot. So we're sort of chasing our tail a bit. So we're, we're working on that, but we'll have to re retender the framework. So where, where contractors just simply haven't been able to do it, we're, we're trying to kind of do that now. We've got a backlog of about 13 cases, I think, that we're going to hopefully get going with in January. Um, the last slide, I suppose I just I've just sort of called it food for thought. Um, there's there's some things making us you know think about how we do DFG longer term. There's been changes in legislation, so we've had the housing renewal policy there since 2014. There's been the Social Services Wellbeing Act in 2014, and all of these these acts um, result in changes to. Uh, recommendations, legislation, whether it's something like you can't charge a, you know, a mobility scooter inside a house because the battery is a fire risk, you know, so we're trying to keep up with those sorts of things because the DFG operates under a policy from 1996. Um, and obviously I put the, the the Welsh government's kind of plan for health and social care, um, which was 2018, it talks about a kind of a whole system approach to healthcare where um, everyone in Welsh should have a longer, happier life, you know, remain active, independent and, and live in their own homes for as long as possible. That's bottom line is what we're all trying to achieve. Um, I think it's 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 got us thinking about it's got the region and, and, and Wales, I suppose, as a whole thinking about um, they're looking at a uh, strategic adaptations framework. Um, and, and that document really is about trying to make sure that there's a kind of fair and consistent service regardless of tenure. Because at the moment, if you're in a um, council owned property or a private owned health property, um, you, you do get a different, you do get a different um, service. And, uh, and this is supposed to support multi-agency working in the kind of better planning and integration of services. So really we want the public to have one single point of entry to services, you know, and those services should be kind of preventative, and fair and equitable you know, so you're getting the same service across the board so i know that this guidance is being finalized in 2023 uh, 2022 with a view to having it properly implemented over that next 12 months um so we have been having internal discussions with colleagues from housing and social services around uh, how we can align services and make sure that they get in with this piece of work and we're hoping that that piece of work that we'll we'll look into will be will be done by autumn of next year um the welsh government the one final point i suppose is the welsh government wants to remove as as request and julie james wants to remove means testing this has it has its pro on in that case on access to funding but we have a finite amount of funding we get the money from the capital program um and there's a there's a concern um from my colleagues in other areas that, that this funding could be happy about you know going for it whereas actually the people with the most need may not be um you know and i i'm slightly concerned that we could end up with a backlog because the money could be depleted and then you you start a new year a long way to invest. So Cardiff have agreed to remove means testing um, and they'll be implementing that from April. We're still having internal discussions about whether we will. Um, and I think there's a way of us looking at putting certain, I suppose, breaks on it in, in some ways to make it, you know, so for example, if you were requiring £150,000 adaptation on your house, we can put a charge, I think Carolyn mentioned earlier, we can put a charge on the house um, but what it does is it means that you're able to live in that building, uh, in that house that you live in. So I'm, I'm thinking back to that case at the beginning where it would mean that I, if I was able to live in my own house and it meant that having a £100,000 charge was put on it for me to live an independent life in my own house, I would do it. So I think there's all sorts of things like that that we've got to um, look at as a way of um, kind of addressing the means testing issue. So that's 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 it. Anybody? Okay, thank you for that, Phil. Um, back in 2015, I actually spent about a month temping for the Disabled Facilities Grants. 
So um, you were based at the regeneration office then in Halton Road. So I, I'm fairly familiar with what you do. But um, I can see Andrew Parker, Councillor Parker, has his hand up. So go ahead, please, yeah. Councillor Parker. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Philip. Just just a brief one. I mean, how how are we able to make people aware of these grants? Obviously, um, a lot of them are not computer savvy at, at the age where they're likely to receive that. Do we have a a system in place that Sorry, we can we can utilise? Thanks. Apologies, I got disconnected as feared then, but I'm now reconnected, so I'm, okay. I'm very sorry I missed in Councillor Parker. Yeah, no, 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 no problem, Philip. Um, now, what I was saying is, um, how do we make the elderly aware that these grants are available? Um, you know, a lot of them aren't computer uh, literate at the age that they need it. Um, is there a, a system in place whereby uh, it's relatively straightforward to? you know yes. find out exactly yeah, I mean, what a lot to our, do a lot of our referrals come through occupational um therapists as well and social services so the people who are largely in the system um but when it when it's means testing it might it might be it might be you know different in that we're we're we'll be opening up much more widely um which will have resource implications for us both in terms of staff and and funding but um at the moment it every single um, recipient or applicant comes through a, uh, um, an occupational therapist referral. Yeah, good, good. Okay, now I understand that. Thank you. Yeah. Apologies for my signal. Okay, no worries. Um, I can see Councillor Nugent Finn has a question. If you'd like to go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Phil. Great presentation. Um, Phil, following on from Councillor uh, um, Andrew Parker's question, you know, getting it out into the public domain as much as we possibly can. Um, I, I understand. Oh, my my um, IT is acting up now. Can you all still hear me? Yes. Yeah. OK, I, I understand uh, what you're saying with regards to sort of, you know, uh, the, the production line would be, you know, uh, occupational health, et cetera, et cetera. But for patients in hospital, who um, have had, um, you know, perhaps operations or illnesses, which is going to affect their ability when they come out of. What systems in place there? To my knowledge, Phil, there's not there's not a lot. Yes, it would go by the occupational health or the uh, in-house hospital-based social worker. But um, again, some people don't have access to those provisions, and they wouldn't know about this grant, and they may need access. I can I got a case I'm working with now, Phil, so it's really on point for me. And, um, you know, she doesn't have she's no knowledge of this. So I'm trying to broker in all this support. Um, I, I know it. But again, as a, as a lay person, they wouldn't know it. Perhaps we could get this message into health somehow as well, Phil. I, I, say, yeah, I know it's yeah, mean test. I know all of those things. But it's, it's sometimes yeah, yeah. just having the knowledge for people is, is the first point. You know, it, it's the most important yeah. part, really, Phil. I suppose I suppose one of the reasons why that isn't it isn't massively widely publicised um, is that the money often i suppose runs out you know care and repair they've run out of money mm. um by december so we were able to mm. find some additional money for them through the enable grant i think it was yeah so the the danger is though those in most need are generally in the system and um mm. you know when you're leaving hospital you're, yeah. you're getting very you know referrals on but um mm. there is there is that concern it's a bit like the same concern i've got about the means testing and that anybody exactly. and everybody can, mm. can then apply but yeah um yeah probably need to just work in those breaks and levers or whatever to make sure that it's going to the right people. I think so, Phil, because even in some circumstances, it may be the, there's minimal entitlements, but it's still that that entitlement, you know? So we're not yeah, talking yeah, well, about, that's, you know, that's using that. In fact, that family member of mine that didn't know yeah. about it was struggling yeah. at home with yeah. bad knees because, and only because I work here that I knew about yeah, it. So exactly. actually, it's, you know, it's a really valid yeah. point. I'll take that back. Yeah. Thank you very much, Phil. Thank you, Chair. Philip, sorry, if I can come in with, with a sort of a continuation of that. If it's mean tested, I mean, quite often, as you say, handrails and things like that, do they actually get mean tested or is there a sort of a limit of, say, £10,000 or a figure whereby it can be done quickly without the means testing? Um, yes, I'm just checking now. I think I was going to say, I think it's medium and large, um, yeah. medium and large adaptations are means tested, but smaller 
um, adaptations are not. So that that's where that's where the like sort of care and pair can go in and 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 um, make yeah. changes or stairless stairless. We're not we're not means testing stairless. Okay, thank thank for that. Okay, Mike, you wanted to come in. Uh, just to pick up on some of the conversation that, that Councillor Nugent Finn raised, um, clearly something may well have gone wrong in, in that instance because most people who have had a stay in hospital should have had a discharge plan uh, considered prior to discharge. Um, obviously we have community-based and uh, hospital-based OTs and, and obviously the uh, you would expect those professionals to have um, conversed i suppose if 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 a need was was uh, identified one of the things I, sh I i think i would also point out is that um the council and cardiff and vale uhb together with other stakeholders and partners are currently looking at models of future provision uh, for residents of the vale uh, so for example the vale at the moment are looking at a a model called the Vale Alliance, which effectively is going to be, and as we know, the age old problem that we've had over decades of social care and health care, uh, never the twain shall meet. Um, so the Vale Alliance is actually going to be a formal uh, partnership arrangement. And therefore, if a resident has an issue, which is a social care issue or a health issue or a mixture of both, then that person's needs and issues will be dealt with uh, as a one-stop shop effectively. So at the moment, budgets for health and, and social care are being aligned or have been aligned as, as, as members will, will already be aware. Um, but this is about service alignment. So this is bringing professionals together, bringing uh, opportunities in terms of joint training. And in some instances, uh, individuals that would have the same skill set for both health and for both social care. So instead of having two people doing um, similar roles, you'd have the one person doing that work. So I think there are um, measures in place that should improve the experience of members of the public going forward. Um, Suzanne Clifton is leading on the Vale Alliance work. Um, obviously in her role as being a, a, a joint uh, social services and, and health appointment. Um, and that work is, is gathering pace um, and has done for the last couple of months. Okay, thank you, Mike. Councillor Nugent Finn, did you want to come back in? That very briefly, is that okay, Chair? Thank you so much. Yes, um, it's brief. <laughs> it will be. Yeah, Mike, there was a discharge, but it's to the it's to a property that's uh, suitable, but it's not her own home. Um, and so, so now she's out of the system where she's got access to, so, and now she's on a waiting list for uh, our health and social work in the Vale. So she slipped right through the net. That's that's the example I was given. Um, ha the Vale Alliance sounds like a good solution to a lot of this. Often they go hand in hand. Totally agree. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mike. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, Rachel, you've still got your hands up. OK, I don't see any more questions. Um, I'm not sure if you heard me earlier, but back in 2015, I was actually an office temp at the Disabled Facilities Grants in the Regeneration Office on Halton Road um, for about a month. Um, so I know how hard you guys work. I'm fairly familiar with how how it all goes and I just want to say thank you again to yourselves for everything that you've done during the last year. Okay. Thank you Chair, I'll pass it on to the team. No problem. Okay, so I think we're ready for the next item and that is item number six, Corporate Safeguarding Midterm Report. If you'd like to come in please Mike. Thank you, Chair. I, I will be brief. This report, um, uh, midterm report, was presented to Cabinet um, recently on the um, 22nd of November and has been referred to Scrutiny Committee just for consideration. To 
run through the report very briefly. Uh, as members are aware, there's a corporate responsibility for the council to ensure we have effective safeguarding arrangements in place for children and adults. Um, the report before you is uh, an update on the effectiveness of those arrangements and developments over the last period. And the referral to scrutinies for, for, for you to consider those, those arrangements. Um, as you're aware, um, there is a cross council response to safeguarding responsibility and that sits in a number of portfolio portfolio areas and a number of com committees um, statutorily we're required um, to to consider um, safe corporate safeguarding as part of the social services and well-being act and specifically under part seven of that act the work of the corporate safeguarding group uh, focuses on the strategic overview of safeguarding across the council. Um, I'm a member of the corporate safeguarding group and it's chaired um, by the uh, cabinet member for uh, social services and the uh, director Lance Carver. Um, we've met regularly since April 2021 and a number of priorities have been um, considered. Uh, good practice has been shared um, both internally from work within the Vale, but also regionally in terms of the work of the Regional Safeguarding Board. We've also made connections with uh, the new Wales wide uh, DBS representative uh, who recently came to, to give us a pre uh, presentation around how they can support local authorities in terms of our work around barring and referrals. Um, the group also considers safer recruitment data um, and, and what I'm pleased to be able to say is, on the whole, uh, our safer recruitment practice is, is well adhered to by all areas of the council. Um, and, and as I say, we regularly scrutinise those reports and deal with any issues that, that, that do arise. Priority areas of work, we, we have a work plan and within that work plan, the priority areas uh, we're currently looking at um, is looking at our safeguarding data and making sure that that is more focused and provides uh, a much more outcome based uh, set of, of, of data principles. We are currently reviewing our safeguarding training and uh, associated materials. We're looking at our learning from reviews. Uh, we're pro progressing developments in response to internal and external audits. And we're considering a uh, wider quality assurance activity that's, that, that can support the, the work that we do. At 2.7, 2.8, 2.9, uh, 2.10 and 2.11, I won't go through each of those paragraphs, but it gives you a flavour, an indication of where we are in, in each of those areas of activity. Um, and as I say, I'm happy to take any questions uh, on the mid-year report. There is a full year report, which is obviously members will have seen in, 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 in the past, which is much more detailed, uh, gives a lot more examples, case studies and indications of individual operational areas of work that we carry out. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you very much, Mike. Do we have any questions? No. OK, Councillor Nugent Finn. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Chair. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, as a recommendation, really, if we could put this to Cabinet, because um, the only people that don't uh, are not DBS checked is, is our is elected members. So that's something that I feel we should take forward as a group and as a local authority and as elected members. I've had this discussion with Democratic and they don't feel the need that we should, but perhaps it's more of an individual choice. I am. My uh, DBS is fully enhanced and I pay for it and renew it. But I think as a, a point of good practice, we're investing so much in our staff uh, in, in the training. We've got all the the um, the, the, uh, app, the app and everything else. Why why are we not DBS checked? It's something I'd like to take forward with the recommendations of cabinet, please, Chair, if everybody else was in agreement. Mike would be you know, very welcome to see what your thoughts are on this. Chair, Councillor Nugent Finn, I think I can uh, uh, clarify that issue. Um, DBS barring and checking is obviously um, constrained by legislation and statutory framework um, in terms yeah. of the role of members, unless members as part of their role are uh, actively 
um, engaging uh, on their own with uh, 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 individuals, adults or children in their own mm. homes or on a place, uh, um, uh, for example, like a children's home or a, a yeah. sheltered housing scheme. Um, there is no statutory basis on which mm. um, uh, you, you can apply for a DPS check. It has to be regulated activity. And my understanding is that the role of members in, in, in your role, unless it's specific, regular, and mm. as I say, a, as part of, uh, of your day to day business, um, mm. it wouldn't be allowed for within the regulation. I can mm. clarify uh, that, however, with Democratic and with our uh, lead safeguarding officer, uh, the yeah. operational manager uh, for safeguarding, and, and I can provide you with an update of that. And perhaps yeah. on the back of that, uh, you may may wish to consider this matter further. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Um, you know, we do meet with families and children at surgeries. Uh, I'm doing a joint home visit with a housing officer tomorrow to a single person. So, you know, there is certain elements where I feel that we, we do meet that criteria. But I appreciate you taking it forward, with Mike, and I look forward to the response. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Chair. Councillor Parker. Yes, thank you. I mean, we are all probably governors of schools as, as councillors. I don't think I've ever had been asked for, for that. Um, but quite clearly, we, we, we are able to move around schools with our um, governor's badge. Um, so maybe that ought to be included as well, uh, Rachel, because, you know, we do know of, of problems. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you, Councillor Parker. Yes. OK, Mike, are you looking to come back in? Sorry, it's just to clarify that um, it has to be regulated activity. And I suppose in the role of a governor, you're not loan working necessarily with um, vulnerable in individuals in, in, in that respect. Uh, each of our schools does have uh, safeguarding policies and practices, which I know mm. as part of uh, councillors inductions and lay members mm. inductions, that mm. forms part of your um, your, as I say, your induction process on onto those bodies, but as mm. I say, it, it is it, it is about the defined activity. Not not every role mm. an in, individual is able or it requires um, a, a DBS check. But as I say, I, again, I'll, I'll clarify that point, and um, perhaps through Mark, I can provide um, the statutory basis um, on which DBS checks are, are made, and then obviously we can further that from from that position. Yeah, thank you, Michael. OK, thank you. Um, Councillor Parker, you still have, do you want to come back in? Your hand's still up. No, sorry, drop it That's now. OK. I forget to do it all the time in work meetings. Yeah. <laughs> there we are. <clears throat> I think okay. I've lowered now. There we are. Yep. Lower hand, there we are. Yep. It's, it, it's, it's slightly confusing because it says lower hand and when you press it, it's the other way around. Yeah. There we are, thanks. <laughs> OK. <coughs> OK, so this is just a reference from Cabinet, but um, if, if you want to go back, take that recommendation back, that suggestion, I should say, back to Cabinet about DPS checks, I, I, I'm happy to. Is everybody else happy with that? Yes, happy. OK. Can so I just I double check, Chair, that recommendation then, is it for to be referred back to Cabinet around the um, possibility of having DBS checks for elected uh, members? I, I yeah. think that's what uh, Councillor uh, Nugent Finn requested. Yeah, yeah okay. it's clarif but, clarification as well. Yeah, clarification as well would be needed. I mean, I, I have a DBS anyway. I had to have it for my job and, you know, so there we go. Um, but... Uh, if we're all OK with that one, then I will go to item number seven, draft Vale of Council, sorry, draft Vale of Le Morgan Council annual delivery plan 2022 to 23. Again, another reference from Cabinet. If you'd like to go through, Mike. If you'd like oh, to chair, can I just come in very quick um, on the agenda, on the two references, just for the minutes. Um, the date of the meeting is incorrect for Homes and Safe. It's got the old meeting date of the 8th. It should be the 16th. But I'll obviously put that in the minutes. OK, yes. Try. OK, just as a, as a point of clarification. Yes, of course. 
OK, Mike. Th thank you, Chair. Um, uh, before you have the draft annual delivery plan 2022-23, and as members are aware, it's aligned to the Council's four wellbeing objectives contained in uh, the Council's corporate plan. Those four objectives is, uh, are to work with and for our communities, to support learning, employment, and sustainable economic growth, to support people at home and in their community, and to respect, enhance and enjoy our, envi our environment. Uh, the report before you sets out how the annual delivery plan has been developed, uh, the consultation methodology and the timetable for the plan. Um, the objectives and associated commitments outlined in the plan will be reflected also in service plans uh, to show how the different services will contribute to those annual delivery plan outcomes. Uh, service plans are anticipated to be presented to scrutiny in the new year together with our proposed service improvement targets uh, for 22-23 as well. Um, publishing our wellbeing objectives at the start financial year will also enable us to meet our statutory obligations under the Local Government and Election Wales Act and also the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. The ADP draft is a bridge between the five-year corporate plan and annual service plans and it details our key activities to be undertaken in year three of the corporate plan and will be published in the spring of 2022. In this year's ADP, there's a particular em emphasis on a series of cross-cutting themes. Uh, six, there's six of those themes, which are Project Zero, Community Capacity, Hardship, Care and Support, Transformation and Infrastructure. And you can see within the body of the report, there is a, a description of, of those activities uh, and, and what that focus looks like. Um, in terms of development of the plan, um, the, uh, there have been a number of detailed discussions with senior leadership team. Um, we've also considered, obviously, Council's performance for 21-22, our reshaping approach, uh, risks identified in our corporate risk register, uh, our statutory duties, our resources, um, uh, early discussions around our coronavirus recovery strategy, our PSB wellbeing assessment, finding of the work of our regulators and the views of our residents and partners. The timetable for consultation and approval of the ADP uh, is in the body of the report. And as you can see, um, once uh, consultation uh, has ended at the uh, beginning of January, it's anticipated that um, amended responses and feedback will come back to uh, corporate resources, uh, corporate performance resources scrutiny committee in February. Uh, Cabinet will then consider the final draft in, in, in February, at the end of February, with the delivery of the ADP then from April through to March. The Council considering the final draft in, in March prior to that. At the moment, we're consulting on the draft plan. It's live on the Council's website. Uh, we're consulting with Town and Community Councils, Employee Consultative Forum, uh, members of the voluntary sector and Joint Liaison Committee. We're also undertaking a, a specific piece of work with youth services to ensure that we take account and views, engage with the views of younger people. Some of the examples in the plan um, and perhaps I can draw your attention to perhaps objective three, which is to support people and home in the community specifically, because for most or a lot of our activity, that's that's where uh, a number of our uh, areas that members have raised in the last uh, the last year are found. And just to pick up on uh, safe avail um, and community safety was was mentioned. So part of the work for next year will be for us to develop a new safe avail uh, strategy for 2023-2026. Uh, clearly maximising council house building you'd expect to, to, to be in there and an indication that we would look to um, home view phase two as an example of, of one of the schemes that we're looking to introduce next year. Uh, plus a, a hundred, uh, an additional 100 new council homes uh, to be de delivered in that year as well. Uh, together then with, uh, finally, we need to develop our, our new five-year local housing strategy. And again, that work will uh, commence in earnest 
uh, after after April. Um, work of this committee is featured in other areas of the objectives and reports. Um, for example, um, members will be aware of the work that we're doing around uh, uh, food um, and, and the work in Panath at the Food Hub, which is our, our, our first uh, such um, uh, piece of work, which um, uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before, uh, our new food pod has been delivered uh, to the St. Luke's estate. And um, against all my expectations, not my wishes, but my expectations, uh, the new food pod will be up and running the week before Christmas. And given um, the pressures that currently our residents are facing uh, in terms of those inflationary pressures and cost pressures that we all know about in terms of fuel, food um, and, and, and other things, um, probably is 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 uh, going to be hugely welcome for the communities in in Penarth. Um, I'll leave it there, and and obviously uh, happy to answer any questions on the uh, uh, the mechanism for approving the uh, the annual delivery plan. Thank you. Sorry, wouldn't let me unmute myself then. The button just kind of stuck. OK, thank you very much for that, Mike. I can see Councillor Hanks has her hand up if you would like to speak. Hi, Mike. Thank you, Chair. I was just going to ask, um, I see there's been difficulties recruiting to rapid rehousing officers. Um, I just wondered if you had an update on what staff shortages were like, please. Yeah, we received some we received some additional funding um, uh, as part of the work over the last 12 months. Um, and I think um, I think we have to bear in mind that the pressures on our homelessness and housing solutions service has been immense uh, really for the last 18 months. And, and as I mentioned earlier, I'm not I'm, I'm not seeing that easing up greatly, given the, um, the, the, the numbers that are coming through the door. Uh, we're fishing in a relatively, as as I suppose colleagues in social care are, we're fishing in what seems a relatively small pool of resources and people at the moment uh, with the skills and expertise. Um, we are working extremely hard, uh, obviously, uh, to to appoint people into these positions. We we also are working with agency, uh, uh, local agencies, um, uh, uh, where we aren't able to directly employ. Um, but it is challenging at the moment in terms of employment across, uh, certainly across that area of activity. Um, I know Nick is on the call. I'm, I'm not sure that there are any updates there. Um, Nick Jones is our operational manager that covers the Housing Solutions Service. Nick may well have a, a an update for you. Yes, go ahead, Nick. I see your hand up. Okay, th thanks, Chair. Just to sort of add to my point, the, the specific posts in question are rapid rehousing officers, um, and they are housing support grant funded, really. So we were recruiting those via our support provider, uh, support provider partners, um, and they, they have found it difficult. And what they're finding is, whilst it's really, really good that housing support grant has been increased by Welsh Government across Wales, what we're doing is competing against other other areas, really, other, other cities. Uh, to recruit the same people. So support providers, you know, we've got some really good support providers working for us at the moment, but there is a bit of an inflation in terms of salaries and people are moving from one agency to another or moving areas, etc. So there has been a bit of a gap, but the support partners who are recruiting us at the moment are work, working on it. And I think one of those posts is, is currently filled now uh, and they're they're trying to recruit another, but just conscious the pool of people that we're fishing from, as, as Mike said, is, is really shallow, really. So it is one to keep an eye on in, in future and, um, yeah, just be mindful of, really. Yeah, and I think we all appreciate how hard everybody has worked there and to be short staffed isn't um, isn't brilliant for for you all but um, no thanks for all the work that has been done thank you okay does anybody else have any other questions i'm taking that as a no <coughs> okay as this is a reference from cabinet um are we happy to accept? Happy to accept. Okay. Second. Uh, okay, thank you. 
So final item of the night, agenda uh, item eight, annual delivery plan monitoring report, quarter two performance. Go ahead, Mike. Thank, thank you, Chair. Again, I'll, I'll take you through this report quickly. It's a very, very long report, obviously, with lots of appendices, but perhaps if I draw out the, the pertinent um, points, um, that might be helpful. So the performance report uh, is quarter two, so the 1st of April to the 30th of September, and uh, outlines our progress to achieving the annual delivery plan 21-22. Um, just to reflect, um, our commitments this year uh, show an overall green status for the plan at quarter two. All four corporate plan wellbeing objectives were attributed a green performance at quarter two, and this is positive given obviously the ongoing challenges arising um, from the pandemic. 95% um, of our planned activities have been attributed to green performance, which again is, is, is truly remarkable given the amount of work and pressure staff are under at the moment, uh, reflecting that progress. Only 2% of those um, 313 actions uh, currently uh, AMBER, and 3% um, three, three of those activities were attributed a, a red status. And that's right across the council, not just an, under the remit of, of this committee. Of the 12 actions um, attributed a red performance, um, as you can see, 25% were uh, directly as a result of service reprioritization. Re and in those areas where appropriate work is now recommencing as part of our recovery planning and strategy. Of the 42 quarterly performance measures, um, we are reporting on 36 of those measures, and of those, 61% are green, 33% are amber, um, sorry, 6% are amber, and 33% are red. In relation to the 12 measures attributed a red performance status, uh, the impact of COVID is attributed to 58% or seven of those missing target. As I, as I mentioned, that was the position across the council in relation to this committee, Homes and Safe Communities Committee. 100% of our planned activities are attributed a green performance. Of the seven quarterly measures, 57% are green, 14% amber, 29% red. And 29% red looks a big figure, but it's only accounts for two of our um, planned activities. And if I ask members to look at Appendix C of the report, and in Appendix C, you can see the two measures there which um, are, are identified as red. The first one is the average number of working days to let an empty property in standard condition. And as you can see, our performance unfortunately has worsened in quarter two um, uh, to from uh, 19 point, um, sorry, uh, to 21.6 against a target of 19.57. What we are experiencing, um, and I know others across the council are, issues around supply of materials um, we've also been having issues with availability of contractors and subcontractors. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of work out there at the moment, and our contractors are also dealing with issues in terms of availability of their own staff. However, we do anticipate that um, we will come back into line in quarter three, and uh, at the end of the year, we will outturn on target in relation to that important indicator. In relation to the final indicator, which is currently showing a red status, that's the percentage of households successfully being prevented from becoming homeless, uh, which uh, in quarter two is 48.07% from a target of 82%. I mentioned in quarter one, when I reported on a uh, quarter one figure, um, we must bear in mind that those targets were set sort of pre-pandemic and therefore the activity in preventing homelessness, i.e. people not necessarily coming through our door and not being necessarily having to be provided with accommodation, 
uh, we were extremely good at, one of the best in Wales in terms of preventing homelessness. Given the pandemic and the fact that we now have to accommodate regardless of need, regardless of priority need and regardless of situation given the health concerns related to COVID, clearly that um, prevention activity hasn't been undertaken because there's been a requirement to provide directly provide accommodation. Um, and as you can see from the mitigating actions there, we are suggesting that given that situation, but also given the fact that Welsh Government have indicated to us that they intend to change homelessness legislation in, in the next term, or sorry, in the next year, um, they will be looking to remove priority need as an assessment. Now, what that means is the council is statutorily obliged to assist certain people in certain categories called priority need. That could be families with young children. It could be disabled people. Um, it could be, <coughs> excuse me, people who are vulnerable for a, a number of other reasons. Under the potential changes to legislation, every person that comes to the council who is homeless or is in, 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 in housing need, the council will be statutorily bound to assist. So that going forward will have an impact really in terms of how we prevent or, or, or what we can do to prevent. Um, and we, we will need to review that. Um, the thrust behind the change in the legislation is clearly a desire, is a desire we all have to end or to eradicate homelessness as far as possible. Um, but as I say, we are also mindful of the fact that having uh, a responsibility to assist uh, every individual that, that has a housing need is a big ask. Uh, clearly, that will have an impact on our resources and certainly will be a discussion point that we'll be having with Welsh Government when it comes to those discussions around resources and, and the way that we uh, in future deal with uh, preventing and assisting residents within the Vale into accommodation. Uh, I don't think there's very much more for me to say. As I say, it, it is a much longer report than that. Uh, however, those are the pertinent points for this committee. Thank you, Chair. No problem. Thank you very much for that, Mike. Councillor Aviat, if you'd like to speak. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a fantastic report. Um, uh, there's one thing I'd like to ask, though. It's about housing, and um, I know we don't do preferential treatment, but lately I've seen on social media there's posts about um, housing refugees and leaving ref veterans homeless. Uh, could you try and dispel these myths, please, Mike? Uh, ab absolutely. Um, the, the Council has a, an open access uh, waiting list uh, called Homes For You. Uh, there are eligibility criteria for access to services, which are well document, uh, documented on, on the Council's website. In terms of allocations, uh, allocations are based on a, uh, on a trans, transparent basis uh, in that properties are advertised. And if people are registered and are eligible, uh, then they will be considered for housing. Slight difference in terms of um, uh, 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 refugees as uh, and asylum. Um, I've mentioned at a, a, an earlier committee, uh, we, we've committed as a council to assist in terms of the resettlement of families through uh, the asylum and resettlement uh, service, both in terms of Syria uh, and Afghanistan. Um, we've reported previously to Cabinet on that. We have, uh, at this stage, that, that in terms of the Afghan position, the council committed to providing accommodation for two refugee families. And we uh, are, are uh, uh, obviously sourcing accommodation to assist in that regard. We took a, a different, we took a, a position that we would not use council housing to provide that accommodation. And we are sourcing accommodation as we have done in the past for the Syrian resettlement scheme. We have sourced private rented uh, accommodation uh, for those families. Uh, so, I, in, in terms of that that area, that that is the the position. In terms of um, those 
uh, who register with regard to that have been members or, or former members of the armed service. Uh, there is a specific priority category within our allocation policy, which gives preferential treatment to those in the armed forces or leaving the armed forces. Equally, we provide tailored and responsive wraparound services with uh, colleagues across the council as part of our armed forces covenant. So it's not just about housing, but it's also about other support mechanisms as, as well. And we obviously look to coordinate that through the armed forces coordinator uh, within within the council. So I, I'm happy to to clarify and explain uh, those two scenarios. Thanks very much. OK. Um, anybody else have any other questions? We've uh, we've we've had a few councillors leave as they've had to leave early to make other make other commitments. But um, OK, Nick, if you'd like to come in. You're muted, Nick. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I was just going to update members on the, one of the points Mike made in relation to uh, void loss or relet time, really. Clearly, we're approaching the end of quarter three now, so a couple of months since the, the quarter two report has been put together. And I'm, I'm pleased to say we've recovered some of the performances. Mike confidently predicted we would. So, yeah, we, we have now, and we're currently showing as a, a year-to-date performance against that particular metric is 19.87 days. So slightly below our target because our target's just over 19.5 days, but we've got time, uh, the remainder of quarter three and quarter four to hopefully uh, make back that ground and, and still beat the target. So uh, things seem to be on the right path at the moment. So just by way of reassurance, really, I, I thought I'd give that update. OK, thank you. OK, there are three recommendations for this. And the first is that members consider performance results and progress towards achieving the annual delivery plan 2021-22 commitments as aligned to our corporate plan wellbeing objectives within the remit of the committee. Are we happy with this? Yes. Happy, yes, yeah. Chair. Are we happy with the second recommendation that members consider the remedial actions to be taken to address areas of underperformance and to tackle the key challenges identified within the remit of the committee with their views and recommendations referred therefore thereafter to cabinet for their consideration and approval? Happy with that. OK. Yes, Chair. Um, brilliant. And the third recommendation is that members note the progress being made through our recovery strategy and directorate recovery plans in response to the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. Are we happy to note? Happy to note. Yes, okay. Chair. Thank you. Just bear with me. Item number 13, is there any other items that the chairman, that the chair has uh, deemed well, I have no other business. I have no other items. And um, I'd just like to say thank you all for coming. Thank you to all the officers who have been here tonight. You've all done a good job and you're all do your teams are all doing wonderfully well since all this COVID. So again, just pass our thanks on. Okay. I'd like to I'd like to echo that. Yes, yeah. very well thank done. It, it's yes, it's a very, you. very challenging time and I don't see an end to it yet. So uh, you're all doing really well. Just make sure none of you get burnt out. Mm. OK, there will never be an end, unfortunately, as Michael knows. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, oh, it's, it's getting a bit worrying, really. Uh, okay. your, your, your support uh, individually and as a committee is, is, is very welcome and appreciated by my staff. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. We wish Chair, them all Chair, a happy I, Christmas for us, Michael. And Chair, can I just think uh, and say that I think we all work excellent as a team yeah, on, us, on this committee. You know, mm. we really respect each other. I think it's fantastic. Thank you. Well, it's not yes. political, is it? It's not political. No, we all, no, care, thanks, about, we all care about people Do you and, like and yeah. politics, and that's, that's it. That's it. Well, have a nice and Christmas, and I'll see you all in the new year. Hopefully. Yeah. Bye, Heather. Bye. 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 Just yeah, to let you know, the all. date of the next meeting is right, the 12th of January. 12th, right. All right 12th of January. Okay. 6 p.m. Uh, as well. All right. 
Thank you. Have a Thank great you. Christmas and a wonderful new year. Yeah.